I spent, uh, I went to Southern Methodist University, graduated from seminary. <coughs> and uh, that's why I became a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> There's humor there. That's right, that's right. Uh, no, I eventually uh, went into uh, television and uh, worked with Jim Lair uh, on Newsroom. That's how I really got my start as a news reporter uh, covering the war and poverty with the Johnson administration. Uh, introduction into America and it uh, did some great things. Uh, from that uh, they decided that maybe I should become the program manager. And, uh, what year was that? Uh, that would have been uh, 1974, 73 when I was... So you started that program. Yeah, program, as program manager, right. Did and you start at KRE when it, uh, when it started? 1970. Yeah. yeah, that was first year. I had never been a reporter, and Jim Lair said, well, if you want this job, uh, I'll hire you. He said, well, I'll tell you now that the top dollar for you is going to be $10,000 a year. So uh, I said, well, it's better than trying to sell pizza because I don't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> and he hired me. And uh, from there, uh, I did fairly well. On Newsroom. We had a good reporting team. It was a great group. A few. Uh, that's back in 1970. So I don't know how many of you were watching it. I thought I knew about it. But uh, A.C. Green was a great reporter. Came out of one of the news uh, areas here. Uh, Jim Lair, of course, was from Dallas Times Herald. Uh, highly regarded reporter. He was the editor of Newsroom. Uh, John Tackett, Billy Porterfield, great reporters. Came out of Detroit Free Press down to Texas. He was from Texas originally. Uh, and Lee Cullum, who's fantastic and still is. Uh, so it, it was a really very uh, heralded group of reporters, and I was privileged to be in that group. I really learned a lot from them. But uh, I got a little tired of doing the reporting, uh, and uh, was thinking what I might like to do next, and Bob uh, uh, Wilson pulled me in the office one day and he said, I'd like you to take over programming for the station. And I said, ooh, that's great. He said, that's a salary increase, right? He said, yeah. <laughs> that's a bit. Smart man. And uh, so I started working with him. Bob and I were big friends because we were both big Boston Red Sox fans. That was one thing we had going for us. And uh, I actually went up to Boston for a couple of games during that time. Uh, but the, uh, the program managing, was also a new uh, drill for me. I liked it, uh, trying to attract an audience. Uh, I was always interested in entertainment. That's why I started. I don't know how I went through seminary, but that's where I started. <laughs> As I said, uh, the Ernie Kovacs show, I thought it was 1952 when I saw the mm -hmm. first Kovacs shows. And uh, God, I was just knocked out by it. And I haven't seen a single episode or anything from Ernie Kovacs since then. Mm. These are the four things I remember. Uh, he is walking on stage. There's a huge stone with a mermaid sitting on it. He walks past it. He's always doing this to the audience. And he gets on the other side of the stone and you hear a splash. He looks back. He looks at the audience. And he keeps walking, visual, but the impact of it was hysterical. It was this woman sitting up on this high thing, and suddenly she falls into the water. Nobody says a thing. <laughs> and the uh, Indy 500 race car driver. I thought that was amazing. I mean, he had about five, ten seconds of him trying to start his car. And he did it twice, or maybe three times, I think twice in the first segment show. And then the next week, about five minutes into the show, there was a guy trying to start his car. He was guaranteed to win that particular year. And, uh, to me, that was pretty cool. The other was the Nairobi Trio, which knocked me flat. I thought it was hysterical. So Kovacs, uh, library, oh, the library, he had a marvelous segment. He goes for the books, yeah. and you see the title, 
He wants to know what the audience thinks. He puts it back. And then he comes to one, what was the title of the one woman dies of? Camille. Oh, Camille. <laughs> <laughs> and the big cough comes out, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all visual comedy, and that's what I remember Kovacs for, is visual yeah. comedy. Uh, <clears throat> now the Pythons, uh, I don't, I'm not going to repeat what I said to uh, Robert uh, <coughs> Kolonsky uh, for the Dallas Morning News that was printed, but a part of it, uh, we got, I, I got this call from New York from this uh, guy that I bought many programs from for the uh, PBS, for uh, KERA. And he said, we got a show here, and he said, uh, we can't sell it. Wendy was the guy's name. And he said, uh, and he told me, he said, he, he had sold us a lot. He, he told me the truth. He said, we can't sell it. And he gave me these stories about where he had taken it and what they had done. They all turned white and they walked out. <laughs> So I said, God, it sounds perfect for KERA. <laughs> <laughs> and he shipped all of the cassettes. And I walked in Friday morning, Wednesday he called, Friday they were there, lined up against my wall. You remember those cassettes? They were about that big, about that wide, you know, like that. It was a bunch. So I said, well, that's a Saturday uh, job. And I came in Saturday. And I started watching the shows, and uh, I mean, I was in tears <laughs> when I finished one show, and then I sat there and I watched, and my then, uh, about to be my wife, uh, Linda, we were going to have dinner uh, that night, and uh, I realized that I was hearing these pebbles hit the window of the studio. <laughs> and, I went to the window, she was in there, what about that? <laughs> it was five o'clock. I had been there all day watching the shows. And so I, I became a fan uh, instantaneously. <clears throat> I never have uh, ceased to be so. Their use of the language. Uh, who would have ever thought of doing a cheese shop sketch? <laughs> <laughs> they got not a damn piece of cheese. <laughs> He just didn't know where it was going. Surely he was going to find something. And old Palin just sat there and said, not today. <laughs> uh, their language, uh, it was it Churchill said that two great countries are separated by a common language? The Brits have a way with language. They really do. They're masters of language. They love them. They love language. And they study it, and they become quite proficient in the use of the English language. And they can twist it in ways that make things funny, it just by the way they use the uh, the words and the descriptions of what they're doing and what they're talking about. But I uh, I, I saw the uh, uh, the lumberjack song. <laughs> when I saw that, I literally fell on the floor, <laughs> and I said, "Oh God." What's Bob Wilson going to think about that? <laughs> That's when I knew that uh, I wanted the shows and I had to soften up the scenery for Bob so that he would go for it. And I knew Bob had a great sense of humor, so that was not a problem. But maybe this was getting a little too far out <laughs> for the Dallas audience. I mean, this was 1974, and the city was very conscious of its uh, image very conscious, and I'll even say conservative. And uh, we'd be flying into a territory that I don't think had been on television, mm -hmm. certainly not in Dallas and not in America, as evidenced by the fact that I knew that WTTW, where Se Second City was born, had turned it down. San Francisco had turned it down. Los Angeles had turned it down. Boston had turned it down. WNET New York had turned it down. So it was risky. I just knew that by virtue of the history of its path through America and lack of broadcast. 
So I called him and told him I wanted to meet with him Monday morning. And Mike Ritchie, a buddy of mine, he, that's another guy who was on News Room. He and I were very good friends. Uh, he had a raging sense of humor, and I knew he'd like it. So I wanted him in the room when we showed the shows that were episodes. And I picked the two. Uh, I had to show them the uh, Lumberjack song, and uh, then I picked the Cheese Shop to sort of make sure that there was going to be at least a Twitter. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't get halfway through the Lumberjack song. And Bob literally throws the notebook. He always brought a notebook to take notes to remember what he wanted to say about the, anything he was studying or, or working on. He threw it all the way across the room and was on his knees laughing. Hallelujah, we want baby. Picked up the phone and uh, he went out of the office laughing. But Mike went out of the office laughing and uh, I called uh, I called New York and I said we want them all. <laughs> and they gave us a really good price, really they did. <laughs> so that, we had that plus on our side, dirt cheap, and we were going to get them all. And we did. Bob came out. He was a little white. I mean, he wasn't smiling. I'll put it that way. And I asked him. I said, Bob, how did they go? He said they didn't walk out. I said, did anybody laugh? He said, well, Betty Marcus laughed. I said, well, that's one. <laughs> yeah, probably there, there were 30 board members. <laughs> I, I think at that point he might have been a little nervous. And I, I was real nervous. We put it on, we played. The, you, you get the ratings, the Nielsen ratings. But then we only got it uh, four times a year. November, wow. February. Uh, May and uh, maybe July. Uh, the book came out and we were sweating the whole time because we didn't get much reaction on the phones from it. We didn't know what was going on, who was watching. And he came down the hall and he had the thing in his hand. He said, well, he said, I haven't looked, but the verdict's in. And I literally am sitting there wondering. I said, this thing bombs, man. I'm dead. <laughs> Forget about it. It was your idea to be late. <laughs> and uh, the numbers were great. We had, uh, we usually had a 1, 1.25, maybe a 2, 2.5. Uh, the first night was a 6. Then it went to a 7. And uh, I don't remember if in the first month we had a 9, but we got a 9. And that was the night that we beat uh, uh, three of the networks. You had the Independent, and you had ABC, NBC, and CBS, and PBS. And we were number two. So that was extraordinary. And it was late night stuff, which is not the most popular place on the planet for television and for the ratings books. Uh, that's the history of the start of it. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of credit for it. I thought it was ill-deserved. I thought somebody would have found the shows later uh, when things uh, cooled off a bit. They were going to do more movies. And there he is right back then. Uh -huh. uh, I'm talking about you, John. I'm sorry. I just got to it. <laughs> you want me to come down to the an empty chair? Sure. Come on, John. Here's the man. I just promised him you were going to do one silly walk. No. You know, that's <laughs> no. All my artificial joints. How did I have more? Go on. I got three. October 27th, 1930. Yeah. What are you? February 3rd, 1936. Oh my god! <laughs> He's really old. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> <old>? <laughs> Not really! <laughs> He's on my good ear, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, these guys are interested in how it all got started and are in love with the Python. And you guys have made a great reputation for yourselves. Done movies, done it all. In Dallas, yeah. What the hell? Yeah, well, Dallas was your start. I mean, it, it really was a rough start, wasn't it? Well, For the show was in America. I'll mean, tell you, I mean, when, when we started Python, people couldn't make any 
you sense it must be. That's, that's what made it so great. I know. <laughs> uh, and it was terribly funny. And when I, even now, when I show clips from Python, and I, with the light from the screen, I can watch the first two or three rows, and some people are laughing hysterically. <laughs> and then there's always two, like, uh, <laughs> We're just trying to understand it, you know. And you can't prove it's funny if you don't think it's funny. It's, it's not funny to you. <laughs> and, and there was a lot of confusion when we first went out. The critics, you see, they can only spot things that are ten percent original. They never spot it if it's really original. So they didn't really write reviews of us except to say what was in the show. But they never committed themselves about whether it was good or bad. And the first series in England passed almost unnoticed. <laughs> and then at the beginning of the second series, a guy called Alan Corrin, who was the editor of Punch, you know, mm -hmm. a defunct yeah. funny magazine, right. gave us a great review in the Times. And it suddenly all changed. And everybody started to think it was good. But then <laughs> after about two years, we heard that somebody was coming from America to see whether they might want to put it on American television. And it was from WGBH. <laughs> I always remember that one because in England it means with grievous bodily harm. <laughs> <laughs> young guy arrived from Boston and she introduced and we went into a little screening room about as big as this and we sat and we watched the shows and then the lights went up and uh, he had he had gone this color. <laughs> <laughs> he saw his career disappearing into the distance and he could hardly speak and he just wanted to get out of there as fast as he could. So we all said well we'll never be on American television. Mm. And then a lovely woman called Nancy Lewis, who loved our stuff, which in those days was here on record, but not in any other way. She started talking to people in the music business. And then uh, the wonderful Rhonda Villiers. Hi, <laughs> 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 he, uh, he was... Um, he and his people said, well, don't tell him. I mean, you were talking to your friends about You all wanted to put it out. You were all... Well, the, the true story about, behind it is you had program managers, like the guy in uh, Chicago, who was dying to put it on, and they killed him. So management could kill him. Right. And the Boston now, guy, I know he could have bought it. Did they ever get, give a reason? I mean, was it too shocking, or would they get... They thought it was too rude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Naked <laughs> what? It was that. It wasn't that it was subversive. Yeah. No, not subversive in that way. Because you see, we're wildly popular in Eastern European countries. <laughs> <laughs> because during the, uh, the the time they were under Russian domination, yeah. the Russians allowed Monty Python, and the Python was seen as anti-authority <laughs> and subversive. Mm. And so in Hungary and uh, in in Bosnia, I was in Sarajevo. They told me this. They all saw it as the subversive, the thing that united them, uh, uh, sort of subversion of the Russian government. It's the best they could do. I didn't realize that. Yeah. 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 But they, it was rude. It was naked, <laughs> <laughs> naked people. Intentionally but, rude. Oh, you know, yes, of course. Yes, yes. But then you sum it up, Curry. Yeah. Sum it up, courage. Well, I mean, you played it. Didn't, it didn't take courage. I mean, I was dying to put it on. It was easy. It was yeah, but what did, you, what did you think was going to happen? I was, I was scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> Think you were going to get stoned uh, in, in the physical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At that time, Alice, we had things going on that were you know, getting pretty dicey. Yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, it was burning crosses. I, I thought. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't see any crosses. Before. We we did get threatening notes. Did did notes. You? Yeah, but not on that newsroom. Got a lot of threatening notes because they were covering things that had not been covered at Dallas. Really? Tell the truth, all the truth, and nothing but the truth. But when you saw it on camera, we suddenly started seeing a lot of people showing up with news cameras. Really? Uh, and well, that's why we did so well with uh, Holy Grail, 
because that when that opened in New York, we were lucky because you guys had just preceded it. Yeah, just gone up. Because it opened right. in Europe, and then suddenly, thanks to him, yeah. in Dallas, uh, people began to hear it, and then started going out in the stations all over America, and then we opened the Holy Ground, and we got this this tremendous uh, response. You had a fabulous review in the New Yorker. Uh, really? The Holy Grail. Yeah, I forgot that. I, yeah, they, the guy said that everybody was singing. The, the exit lights were, say, were laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great song. Have you never seen it? Oh, I, I may have seen it. So uh, when was this? 1931. <laughs> <laughs> Forget nineteen thirty. Well, we born in the same decade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had that in common. <laughs> we have English in common. Although <laughs> Churchill would deny it. Yeah, <laughs> but so anyway, when we got the the, the funny uh, the protests really got going when we made life for Brian. Mm -hmm. oh. and we yeah. were sitting in London uh, waiting right. to fly out to do publicity. <laughs> And they rang us up and they said, you don't need to come. <laughs> the protesters have done the job for you. Because they'd started protesting before it had even opened. <laughs> you see? And they were outside. I remember somebody had a big sign saying, Monty Python is the agent of the devil. <laughs> I remember thinking, I wouldn't mind being on the 10% of what he <laughs> The news cover, new evening news was started, just started to cover them, and then it became a story on its own, so we didn't actually have to do any public. <laughs> it's John, lovely when that happens. Yeah. John, could you talk about what it means to you on a personal level when when Ron came to you and, and decided to air this and what that meant to you as a Well, well don't forget this all happens at a great distance. Right. Yeah. You know, people always think in this business that you know what's going on, and the answer is they, they don't tell you. I mean, it's quite an interesting experience when you finish a movie because everyone's terribly nice to you. And then you cease to exist. You go back to the trailer and you take the makeup on, you get in the car, and then you'll never hear a word from them until they want you for publicity. But they never say, we finished filming or we're very happy with it or these scenes work particularly well. They just forget completely about you. So we just knew that something extraordinary had happened and we were so starved it was Dallas. <laughs> you know, because in England in the old days, we thought people in Dallas basically ate their own children. <laughs> 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 but as a performer, I mean, it had to be a big victory, I would imagine, because this well, meant... But don't this... forget, this is after it had finished in England. Absolutely, yeah. Right? But now that meant you were, like, global. You were on a global scale. Yes, but we never really thought like that. We okay. were just delighted. And when we thought, well, that's really nice, because now we'll be able to make another film. Yeah. <laughs> because this has been successful. So we then wrote a script that we thought was really good, which was Life of Brian. Yeah. And we couldn't find anybody who would give us three million dollars. It's not a lot of money for a movie. Not a lot at and all. And nobody would give it. We, we started in the UK, that was hopeless, and then we came here and there was not a single Hollywood studio that would give us three million. Mm. And you know the story about George Harrison, you know, Eric gave him the script and George laughed and said he'd put the money up. And Eric called me, I was just going off to do a film with Peter Sellers in, in Vienna. Mm. Um, and uh, Eric said, we got the money. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, George Harrison, I knew he knew him. And he yeah. said he was going to mortgage his house. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said why, why is he doing this? And uh, Eric said, he said, I want to see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in it. He said, Mr. Papalopoulos, who, who leases the, uh, the mount. <laughs> So it was all happening without us really knowing about it. The Python films were four years together, uh, four years apart. It was sort of, what is it, 70? I'll have to stop the picture. 78, 74, and 82. Oh. Yeah, 70, yeah, 74, 78, and 82. So uh, we, we never really knew what was going on. All we knew is that after the success of the Holy Grail, they wouldn't give us $3 million for that time. Because when you get older, you do realize that almost nobody 
in charge knows what they're doing. <laughs> right? And I tell this to people in the Except media, the and they all know what I'm talking about. They've got a fucking idea what they're doing. But the trouble is they don't know that. <laughs> and this isn't a new idea, because the best book ever written on Hollywood was written by a dear friend of mine who just died, Bill Goldman. Mm -hmm. And it called a big stir when it came out. It was uh, it was what was it called? Stories in the, in the screen trade. Yes, yes. Adventures in the screen trade. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. That's right. There's a very good book called The Drunkard's Walk by Leonard Mlowski, which is a, he's a it's about probability, but there's a three or four pages about movies, and but when you feed that, you realise nobody knows, you know. Somebody who, you know, they're hot at the moment, and then suddenly they have a bad slate of films, you know? And then everyone says, oh, they can't do it anymore. And then the next slate that they'd already in place that they didn't have time to cancel is a huge success again. People, it's really worth reading on about the second chapter, I think it is. Leonard Mlodinovsky. Well, he wrote a book with with Stephen Hawking, so he's got to be pretty smart. Yeah. But it's just about statistics and, and about the fact that you never know what's going to work. I mean, I reach the point now. Actually, Bill Goldman told me an interesting story about Sondheim. He what? said, Sondheim said to him, uh, at this point in my career, I'm not going to write a bad song, but I might write the wrong song. Mm. <laughs> well, that, for me, is very interesting. You never, you might write the wrong song. And that kind of subtlety is what defeats most of the people in charge. Mm. John? Can I go now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to give a few That's my favorite, my favorite <laughs> line from uh, Michael Bryan. <laughs> Do you remember when yeah, yeah. yeah. Graham is getting slapped around and nothing happens to him? Well, just put a cap on what you said. Thank God this guy knew what he was doing. I know. <laughs> I know. Bless him. Mm. Bless him. Mm. Would you mind taking a few other questions? Mm -hmm. no, no. Okay. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Down here, John. Um, John, when you guys first started doing Python, did you think it was going to be as big of a success? Did you do it just for fun? Or how did it come about? Because in those days, I mean, it's quite genuinely, we were quite um, purist, pure in our motives. I mean, we worked for the BBC. We knew we would never make much money. I used to get 240 pounds a show. 240 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, for a series, I got 4,000 pounds, including the writing. So we weren't doing it for the money, but we did it for the BBC, although we could get more money at ITV, because they had <coughs> a better track record on comedy. They had good directors and good floor managers. So we went to the BBC because they would make better programs, not because they'd give us more money. And we weren't terribly motivated by money. Because when I started income tax, top rate in England, 83%. I know. <laughs> yeah. That was Howard Wilson and the uh, Labour government. So nobody expected to make any money. We made a living, but we did it just because we loved, we loved to make each other laugh, really. And uh, we didn't ever know what the viewing figure was. What mattered was a thing called the AI, the Audience Appreciation Index. And we would be told that we got a 71, which was extraordinarily high. But we never knew how many people were watching it. Uh, the only answer was enough. <laughs> so when we started, we had no idea. And Michael and I, I can still, this is absolutely true. I remember standing with Michael sort of on the edge, on the side of the, 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 the set where Graham Chapman and Terry Jones were going to do a sketch about flying sheep. <laughs> and we, we stood there and I said to Michael, I said, Mickey, do you realize we could be the first comedy show in history to record a whole show to complete silence? And he said to me, I was having that thought. <laughs> and that's what, you know, we didn't know how people would respond to it. And uh, then on that particular sketch, people started giggling about a third of the way through. And we looked at each other and thought, well, maybe it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the head of department, Tom Sloan, walked into the elevator with the director, saw the director, and said, what are you doing with this awful 
program. <laughs> it was supposed to be funny. And then they had a departmental uh, heads meeting, eight of the, you know, the children's sport, uh, drama, uh, all, all the different uh, departments of the BBC. Six out of eight of them really didn't like it. These people are at, at the top of their department. Yes, I had a question. I was wondering if you could share with us an actor or comedian who inspired you early on in your career. Well, you see, I didn't know I was ever going to go into this until my last year at Cambridge. Uh, the Footlights did this little review in the local professional theatre and somebody turned up and said they wanted to put it on in the West End. Now, by that time, I was 24. So I hadn't been thinking, you know, how am I going to... But uh, you could tell uh, we had a sitcom called Hancock's Half Hour with a fellow called Tony Hancock. And I remember once writing a line and thinking, that's familiar. That's a... And I realized it wasn't the line, it was the intonation. It was Tony Hancock's. In other words, it was still in my head ten years later. Uh, but the, 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 the stuff that I liked the best, we all liked, the teenagers liked, was uh, the Goon Show. Oh, yeah. Uh, which was wonderful. I mean, if you listen to that, so it's still the best use of, of, of radio for comedy that has ever been. And we all loved that. And it was a little bit like Python. It was like a sort of little subversive society of people who liked it and who would uh, do it almost word for word the next day in the playground. It was, <laughs> that was exactly how we were with the, with the, with the, the Goon Show. And I finished up actually doing a show with those guys once. Mm -hmm. I played the announcer at Wallace Greenstate and I was up there with <laughs> Peter Sellers, <coughs> and, uh, Harry Seacombe, and, and, and Spike Milligan. So there were things going on, but I mean, a lot of the comedy we watched in those days the, there was the great early visual comedy, Sir Laurel and Hardy and, and, and Chaplin and Buster Keaton, uh, Marx Brothers, and every couple of years, in, my late teens, I would discover somebody else like the Marx Brothers and suddenly think, who are these wonderful people? Right. And we had a lot of American humor because we had Jack Burns, uh, George Burns, Jack Benny, uh, Phil Silvers, uh, Amos <laughs> and Andrew, <Ooh>, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, there was one other. Uh, but, but we didn't have Ernie. We hardly saw any of her. I, I went to see a thing called North of Alaska. Uh, it was the first time I ever saw him. And I thought, who is this marvelous man? We never had the honeymooners. And we didn't have the show of shows. It was very strange that we didn't have these great shows, but we did have some. And most of the comedy I watched in those days, you know, when I'd done my prep, um, was, 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 was American. And Danny Kaye was the big comedy in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we grew up very, very familiar with a lot of them. Then, in the, my late teens, uh, I started hearing about Mort Saul. One thing that you did as the troop that you wish had made it into that kind of pantheon is like, why did this sketch that we did? Well, you never knew. I mean, there were lines that I always liked that people didn't pick up. Um, there was a line in the Wizard Chocolate in the factory where remember when the, the hygiene inspector goes along and he says, What's this uh, what's this sweet meat here? Spring surprise. And the guy says, Well when you bite into it, uh, steel bolts spring out from it. That's <laughs> like your cheeks. And the hygiene officer says, Where's the pleasure in that? <laughs> Nobody's ever noticed. <laughs> but it is wonderful. What a very touching. With so many of those phrases, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> I had a tiny minor accident with a golf cart on a Caribbean resort about a year ago, and the guy got out and says, "Tis but a scratch." <laughs> Line, one of, one of those. One line. Yeah. Well, I thought uh, from the movie, 
what did the Rom Romans ever do? For us? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Yeah. But that's, that's very nice. Right. But what I've realized much more in the last 10 years is the emotional effect or the emotional connection that people make with Python. Uh, we were, I was in Sarajevo and they were telling me about that. It was four years when the Serbians were up in the hills shooting civilians with sniper, you know, <coughs> lobbing bombs in. And they got an underground uh, garage and set up a, a, an old fashioned, you know, they used to show Monty Python movies and they'd <laughs> creep in there after. And they said, we came out feeling better. We didn't know why, but we felt better. <laughs> and when you realize that it's affected people in that way, and then when, when I do shows now, meet and greets afterwards, the, the men of 60, 70, 80, <laughs> <laughs> they, they say to me, thank you for making me laugh all these years. And often there's a tear in their eye. You see, I didn't know that when I was younger, but you can see that there was something about the attitude. I'll tell you how you sum it up. Someone early on said to me, what I love about Monty Python is that after I've watched it, I cannot watch the news. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot take it seriously. <laughs> and that, I think, is terribly important because we live in such a cesspit of a planet. You <laughs> <laughs> can't see the funny side of it. The termite show you did. No, what was that? The termite show you did. The, term the termites. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> yes, that's right. Now, that was the beginning of the Lima program. Yeah, yeah that's right. It was a set that's up right. That's up right. Up ecological. Right, right. That's what it was. That's what it Can was. Can I go there? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Do I go to when you did ask? Did you? I can't remember. No, I did. I, I really had two questions. One is, were you influenced by Beyond the French? By the... Beyond, Beyond the fringe. the fringe? Oh, enormously, yes. Because it looks like you did Beyond the Fringe, but on steroids. <laughs> well, I tell, you, I tell you what happened, and it, uh, it's sociologically, it's very, very interesting. I saw Beyond the Fringe in Cambridge on its way into the West End. So I saw it about a month before it hit the West End. And I thought it was the funniest show I'd ever seen, and I still think that, because all of those performers were wonderful. Dudley, Peter, Alan Bennett, who's now one of our very best playwrights, and Jonathan Miller, who died, you know, last week. Uh, I'd never seen a show so funny. Uh, to the point when a sketch finished, I would have a pang of sadness. That it was over. And then the lights would come up, and Jonathan and Peter would be there. Oh, you were there. <laughs> but when it got to London, and I thought it was the funniest show I'd ever seen, but that's what I thought. This is wonderful comedy. When it got to London, all the critics saw was that it was satire. And there hadn't been satire up to that point. Mm. Michael Frayne, the playwright, told me he was sitting in, in Beyond the Fringe in the West End, and there were a couple of sort of upper class man and woman there, and Peter came out and started doing Harold McMillan. <laughs> and we could have an air to meet her, uh, her, her here and there. And he goes on like this as a doddery old idiot. And suddenly the person in front of Michael came, turned, turned to the girlfriend and said, My God, he's doing the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> that tells you what it was like in those days. You didn't make fun of the Prime Minister. And they all collapsed because immediately after being on the fridge, had an enormous social impact. David Frost was on five, six months later doing that was the week that won. And it changed the face of Britain completely. It went from being very deferential to quite cheeky and fun. And that was hugely important. But the odd thing was, the, the Beyond the French people didn't particularly see it as satire. And they just thought they were being funny. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they did sketches like uh, Death Penalty. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, throughout the years, I, I'm sure people have asked you uh, for your advice, you know, as an actor or writer or whatever. And, uh, but you've had such an interesting and, and different career path. I, I wonder what it is you say to people, because it's probably hilarious. Well, I, do, I, I say to actors, I say, find a scene with your favorite actor or actress and watch it until you get bored. 
Because when you are bored, when you're no longer affected by it emotionally, then you can see how it's done technically. But while you're feeling sad or laughing, you can't see it. It's like the emotional response gets in the way of the analysis. So you just have to keep on. I used to play Peter Cook and Dudley Moore sketches from uh, not only but also. And I would play the sketch and then I would sit down and try to write it from memory. And of course you think, well, I don't really. And then you play it again. You think, oh, yeah, that goes, oh, that would have to go before that. And by doing that until I could more or less write it out completely, it was a wonderful learning process. So I think take something that you love and look at it really carefully so that it's not affecting you emotionally anymore. Then you see the technique of it. And as a writer? Hmm? And as a writer? Well, you see, to, trying to remember the thing, trying to remember someone's sketch or something like that, or trying to remember a particular speech and trying to see why it works so well. That's, that's all you can do. And, 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 and you watch, try to watch the best people. Uh, because then the, the sad thing about getting older as a comic is that you do know most of the most of the jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a, I'm sorry. Oh, I, right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, out of all of the production, out of all the movies, out of all the episodes, what is your favorite scene? I think well, it's a question of my mood. There are many favorite scenes. I don't want to say there's one that stands out because if you ask me on one day, I might say something <laughs> different. I mean, I was watching last night, or two, no two nights ago, in Austin. I was watching some of the silliest things and I was watching the fish slapping dogs. <laughs> and it still makes me laugh. I've seen it 300 times. And also, and also laughing at the people who are going, <laughs> but there isn't anything in particular. Uh, there's the uh, Faulty Towers, which we don't talk about so much. There's two or three episodes there. The dead body. No. <laughs> the rat. And the one where the anniversary goes wrong. I think those are those are three there. Uh, I think I, the second series better than the first. I think Faulty Towers was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So do yeah. I. Yeah. <laughs> It was good, wasn't yeah, it? it was little good. farces, little oh. thirty-minute farces. <laughs> Manuel, what did you find? <laughs> you know, guess where Andrew Sachs was born? There, Germany. Who said that? Very good, Berlin. Wow. Wow. He was yeah. Jewish and managed to get out of the mid thirties, and he turned into the perfect English gentleman. You know, you never think he was an actor. You would think that he was a rather quiet and very smart bank manager. You see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing about him that I've ever mentioned to him. Manuel is a bank manager. Yeah. That kills me right there. Yeah. <laughs> Was it, was it? He was wonderful. You put the moustache oh, on him was, and was. he just changed it to someone oh, he else. He was quite <laughs> extraordinary. His first language was German. Was it, um, was it either you or Andrew Sachs who suggested that Manuel be German at first and then... No, 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 no. He was, okay. It was always Spanish because just about the time I started that, the early 70s, uh, the, the British uh, restaurateurs or restaurateurs decided that or discovered that if they used people who didn't speak English, they didn't have to pay them so much. Mm. <laughs> there was a stage about 1973 when if you got you went to an English restaurant, you got what you'd ordered, you were lucky. Oh. <laughs> and uh, that was just a manifestation of uh, making fun of the fact that he used this. And what's so important about him? He's a totally sweet person. Aww. He's keen, he wants to help, he never gets cross, he gets sad about his rat. But he's always <laughs> totally positive. And if he wasn't, he wouldn't be so funny. You know? It's the purity. So much. Yes, I had a question. I, I follow you on Twitter, so I have a bit of a clue. Mm -hmm. But what do you think about comedy today and maybe what people are missing in comedy today versus what you have done in the past and what you've witnessed in the well, past. The great problem here is I don't watch much today. And it's partly that when you've done an awful lot of it, 
uh, you sort of know where a lot of stuff is going. So you think to yourself, yes, this is quite good, but I don't want to watch it for an hour. You, you see, well, when you discover somebody, the last person I remember discovering was Bill Hicks. Oh, yes. And when I saw Bill Hicks, I thought, who is this guy? Where has he been? But I haven't had that experience, whereas in my late teens, I was discovering, well, one day I discovered Buster Keaton. I'd only heard about Chaplin and Laurel and Hardy, and suddenly Buster Keaton, and he watched these films, and this treasure trove was opened up. <laughs> So I find that the people who make me laugh now are uh, This is for Ron and John. I mean, when, when you think about it, Ron, I mean, you were responsible for bringing, like, this huge comedy movement to America that, you know, made satire mainstream and, you know, elevated comedy to a new kind of level of consciousness. You know, how does it feel to look back at that and realize that... that that you brought that, like we wouldn't, we wouldn't have nerds at conventions saying the, you know, if you hadn't, if you hadn't brought gumbies, that. Gumbies, gumbies. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we wouldn't have gumbies, like, I mean, I mean, how does it feel to realize that, like, you brought something to America that, that changed uh, art and comedy? I'm pretty damn proud of it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. It was a good move. And uh, I liked it then, I like it now. Yeah. I like it when I say goodbye. <laughs> but it, uh, I think it helped Dallas. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I know the Dallas folk are very proud. Um, you know? should be. And I'm absolutely delighted about that because it, when I ask people where the first, I say Dallas people, and you, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was absolutely splendid that you led the way. I was just wondering what you thought of uh, Tracy Ullman's show. You know, I've hardly watched it. I think she's the most <laughs> wonderful. But this is the trouble. I hardly watch comedy now because it's very <laughs> unusual to see something that excites me. Do you see what I mean? Yes. And I have a small list of things um, that, uh, that I want to watch when I get round to it. But uh, what I feel now is there were so many good writers in the 40s, 50s, 60s uh, who knew how to construct stuff. The, the construction of comedy was far more sophisticated then than it is now. If you look at the sort of um, uh, hangover movie, the, the sad thing is that it's about sex and drugs and booze and celebrity and gambling. Do you see what I mean? Which is what a lot of young people now seem to know about. And I always wanted to make a film called 1776 and a Half. <laughs> because I th think that, 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 you know, there's a lot of fun to be <laughs> Particularly the fact that most of the English uh, soldiers were German. <laughs> From Brunswick and Hesse. You did that and, uh, to yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, it's terribly it, it, funny. It, 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 so I wanted to start with these German <laughs> soldiers talking to each other. You see, and perhaps the American French is the first thing they say is, got out British. <laughs> <laughs> what in that vein? What's the funniest Monty Python sketch mm. that nobody ever got to see? Oh, oh I don't it's think the there was one. Well, it was a very good one with uh, me as a sculptor, and no, no, Graham as the sculptor, me as a as his subject. <laughs> and he's done perfectly good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see oh, no, I didn't see that. He's Why done a perfectly it? good uh, uh, sculpture of me, but my nose was about six inches. <laughs> 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 and you unveiled it and said, well, what do you think? You know, you know how you can never criticize anyone's work. <laughs> you know, I started to say, well, I would think phase and he couldn't get the lines right. We had to literally abandon it. But there was never a good sketch that we that we threw out. That the censors threw out? So again, the censors. That the censors threw out? That's what he just asked. I, uh, but there was never any sketch that said. the censors threw out? Well the censors were the BBC and I thought they were perfectly sensible. I mean I was a little more conservative than the others. I thought sometimes the BBC were right to say no. 
I mean, Gilliam, who I think his is, is aim sometimes is to shop rather than to entertain, uh, he, he did, a, he did a, an animation with Christ being uh, crucified on a telegraph pole. <laughs> I think we can do it now, but, well, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what you can do anymore, because the PC people seem to be a threat to culture, you know. Well, we need to wrap it up. Um, so oh. Would you mind taking? Oh, I know, I'm God. sorry. No. <laughs> I got to tell one story. Okay. And well, he did one me. story. Well, and yeah, then, I then, then want to take some pictures no. too. And then what he did? What he did? Quick. Yeah. I started a company, distribution company, worldwide. We had very few shows. I tried to get the Pythons to represent their shows worldwide when I went into business. That was 1980-81-82. And it didn't work out too well right at first. One day I got a call from London. They said, come over. Uh, we have to talk to you. It'll be of interest. We had about $5,000 in the bank as a company. So I said, I'm coming. <laughs> I went. They had a meeting. They were all sitting around the table. I was in a chair right in the middle of the room. And I said, I want to represent the shows. And what do you think? And they had already decided. And they said, yeah, okay, that, we want you to do it, Ron. We want you to do it. And John, sitting at the end of the table, I have one suggestion <laughs> before you can distribute our shows. The name of our company was De Villiers Donegan Enterprises. You have to change the name of your, pro, your uh, company to uh, Ron's TV Sales. <laughs> you, did that. Oh, you did that. You broke up everybody. <laughs> we had some fun. I remember once we had to set up some company for uh, an American uh, um, accountants were setting up something uh, which was favorable from a tax point of view and they said to us, you know, can we have a number, you know, like the accountants always do, can we have it now in three minutes? And we said we want it to be called Evado Tax. <laughs> uh, John, thank you for coming. Well,